Revolting News presents Tooley's 10th Memorial, July 12, 2020, Fog on Film Part 1 by Paul Lovelace. Good evening. Here is Tully, the mad professor. Tonight is the night for the revolting news. And behind the camera is Norman, the mad engineer. Hi, boys and girls. And uh, the peaceful Lannis is not here with us tonight, but he will be here sometime. Hey, Tooley. Hey, Tooley. Wake up, we need a show. Uh, well, what's the... We need a show by when? We need a show by this afternoon, 12 o'clock. We gotta hand it in, we need a show. Yeah, oh. Oh, what a night, what a day. Oh, that was, uh, Steve Ben and, uh, and Penny Arcade. Oh, a show. A show, then this must. Oh. Well, this might be the, the opportunity to do my, uh, lie down comedy show. Uh, Tui Decay does the oh. Greetings, cable fans. Welcome to Revolting News. And sometimes, not that revolting. I'm Tuli. There's Alex, our co host for tonight. And behind the camera, our ace videographer. Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Norman Savitt. Daddy. And uh, we're going to start. What Daddy? did you want to ask him? Huh? What did you want to ask him? The uh, 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 the videographer. What? Nothing. Okay. Uh, uh, well, nothing is. Uh, uh, I don't like think it's a song. It's a song, but we're not. Uh, I don't know. We not tonight. Tonight we're going to have something. Uh, before, like I tell you about my new job, co-hosting the David Letterman show. <laughs> I would like to make a big introduction for the revolting theater, who I hope aren't. And I hope they're really funny and great and that you'll enjoy them as much as we have and will. The revolters should revolt this way, if you please. It's time. It's time now. And get ready to call me later in the show. And uh, we'll get you all mic'd up and maybe uh, Let's see if we have enough mics to go around. Vincent, give me your mic. I'll get it. Wait, mine just fell off. <laughs> my mic just fell off. It's okay, back here. Right with you. All right, don't worry about it. You know, um, when I was uh, asked to participate in the uh, coming June program on uh, the nuclear problem, uh, I thought a while and I realized that, to me, at least, this problem was a real, was a problem of classic proportions and really required a kind of classic solution. So I decided to compose a song with an extended Proleg Gomenon and to state the argument and then follow with uh, an agonon of about six, uh, six stanzas and a qu in quarto amphibrach form with two dactylic caesuras in each verse and a somewhat modified Alexandrine <laughs> tentrameter to finish it all off. So this is it. Go fuck yourself with your atom bomb. Well, I wouldn't see no cause for alarm if you jerk yourself off. Oh, well, you know you could go over the hill and into the wood. You know it's not very nice to kill so many. Will you go away if I give you a penny? What's bothering you? Are you some kind of nut? Hey, go get late. Try to come to the cut. Oh, what's the matter with you? Did you dead at your guts? Do you think you're strange that you're some kind of nut? 
Do you think that money or megalopa will make you into the ghoul of the hour? What's bothering you? Are you some kind of nut? Hey, go get laid, try to gun to the butt. If you don't like this world, hey, just leave it alone. There are still some of us trying to make it a home. And how did you get your maniac power that can kill us all in about a half an hour? Something's wrong with the system. Yeah, I think they can bring us all to the tombs they bring. Hey, go fuck yourself with your atom bomb. Now, I wouldn't see no cause for alarm if you'd go check yourself off. Oh, well, you know you could. Hey, go over the hill and into the wood oh what's bothering you are you some kind of nut why don't you go get laid try to come to the butt hey go fuck yourself with your atom bomb now i wouldn't see no cause for alarm if you could jerk yourself off i know that you could over the hill into the wood <laughs> Here is your daily proverb. Nothing is fair in the love of war. Penny Arcade. Hey, Radio Free Al. You want to introduce our most special guest? Are you ready for this? Right here at 88.7 FM, we have Tuli. Kupferberg. What an amazing concept. Tuli, let's check out your microphone here. You can go with your elephant. Try, try, try to be joyful. Yeah, Kupferberg. Nobody says that, though. We all say Tuli Kupferberg. It's my slave name. It's your slave. What does Kupferberg mean? It means Copper Mountain. And, and you had to pay for your names and sometimes. So a Goldberg costs more than a Kupferberg. If you didn't pay, you got a name like Schlang, which meant snake, Mr. Snake. You were born on Lower East Side, right? Yeah. Where? On a street that doesn't exist anymore, Cannon Street, with two ends. Well, we moved to Brooklyn when my father had uh, ran uh, three unsuccessful uh, retail stores. So then we moved to Manhattan. It was working class neighborhood. Right. It was East 72nd Street. My first uh, education was uh, when my uh, mother flung open the icebox and pointed to my father and said, there's, look, there's no food. When are we, <laughs> we going to get some money? And my father didn't really have the answer to that. He had, he had a store that was failing. He worked in uh, uh, men's factory, a uh, men's clothing factory the rest of his life as a machine operator. I, I started high school in Manhattan. It's sort of an interesting, uh, terrible episode in my life. I went to Townsend Harris, which was for smart boys. There was a math, the math class was run by, this was the depression, by a guy with a doctorate, you know, it's high school. And when I went to the board and I had to do a math, I had to do a math problem, and he would say they would call it Master. Um, he would say, Master Kupferberg, two zeros. You could get a zero for getting it wrong and for having the the form wrong. And you're supposed to put your name and so on. I said, Holy shit! I'm going to a school where you can get two zeros for one one event. This is not for me. I passed through New Utrecht High School, which was. Uh, it boasted that it was the large, or second largest high school in the world. And, and uh, it was a period of Spanish Civil War, and there were incredible, everyone was a communist. The students, the teachers. So it was a very f sort of, it was free, a, a freer in other ways, I think, than many schools. When I was 18, after I uh, uh, avoided the draft, I ran away from home. I tried to support myself. The only job I could get was uh, really as a longshoreman. There were these bales of 500 pound uh, furs coming in from Russia. And my job was to move them around. I didn't last too long. <laughs> if I would have lasted too long, I would have been, have a great body by now. Then I went to Brooklyn College because uh, I had a choice of Brooklyn or city. They were free then. And uh, 
I had a crush on a uh, young girl who went to Brooklyn, so I went to Brooklyn too. And uh, there I joined the jazz club. And I, and I also was uh, intensely political. There was uh, separate tables in the, in the uh, lunchroom for Stalinists and Trotskyites and uh, unaffiliated, well, the unaffiliated. I had sort of hung out at the Trotskyite unaffiliated. Were people intensely political because they were all immigrant children? Well, it was the Depression, and uh, uh, the U.S. didn't get out of the, the, the war saved American, uh, the American economy. So it was the Depression. If you weren't for, for social change, you were an idiot. During the Depression, right, most American artists, writers, I would say, I would guess, guess that 80% of them were uh, communists or communist sympathizers. Most artists were uh, radicalized by the Depression. When did you become a vegetarian? When I was in Coney Island, I guess in my 20s, and I ate a Nathan's Frank, and I said, Jesus, this thing used to walk around, and now I'm, I'm devouring it. So that was a revelation. And when did you become a pacifist? I remember going to City College campus uptown during the Korean War. We were demonstrating, I think Dellinger was there. And there were four of us, and we were immediately thrown off the campus because what the hell were we doing protesting against the war? And then I was also told then, I think, you know, the next time you come to a demonstration, you should really wear a tie. <laughs> Who will protect us from our protectors? Who shall judge our police? Who will redirect our directors and who release our release? Who will police our judges, and who will will our will? He who chooses his slavery, is he a slave still? Out of paradoxes, man creates his world. He cannot clean his socks, and says, the world is soiled. We are only playboys. In the house of the dead Very few poems get written Fewer still get read Who will police our judges And who will will our will he who chooses his slavery, is he a slave still? inside out. We got to watch where we are. We got to watch them before they kill us. Can't take no chances. I mean, even them kids are liable to grow up and be commies, right? If it's got to be a bloodbath, let it be a bloodbath. What I say is kill for peace. That's the slogan. Just kill for peace. The more students we get rid of, the more peaceful everything will be.
Beware a man who is not moved by sound. He'll drag you to the ground. He'll drag you to the ground. Paul Jolton here, and how are you this afternoon? Did you have a nice weekend? Fine, fine. Oh, the club? Oh, uh, that's just for bad boys and girls. Uh, it's a she, it's a mini club. It wouldn't hurt you. Hi, Israel Danish for Yippie Helmets. You know, nature has supplied a protective headgear for all of her creatures and instruments in the natural world. This is Egg. Egg is covered with a calcium lined, calcium filled eggshell. Watch as policeman's truncheon destroys egg. Egg is gone. I have a little special treat for you today, children. I'm going to read you a poem. A poem that appeared in Police Chief magazine. But first, a word from our sponsor. Tomato is red, waxy, and protected by a shell that, that keeps bugs and insects and nature's prying fingers away from the delicious meat inside. But here's the policeman's prying truncheon. There it is, a destroyed tomato, cantaloupe. Always the favorite of people who like fresh fruit. Policeman's truncheon wastes cantaloupe. The meat of cantaloupe Seeds of cantaloupe. Yuck. Honeydew melon. The closest approximation to the human head known to man. And with policeman's truncheon. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen. The original yippie head. 
Watch as policeman's truncheon destroys Yippie Head. But, bringing forth the Yippie Helmet, the greatest invention that makes one man one up on Mother Nature, and installing the Yippie Helmet on the Yippie Head. Policeman's truncheon seems to provoke <coughs> no response. If you want to be one up on Mother Nature, get yourself <coughs> the Yippie Helmet. This is <coughs> the helmet. Fuck communism, how about that? Hey, folks, I think we're going to have to bleep that. Fuck bleepism, folks. No one can imitate the unique formulation, patent pending, for chemical mace, non-lethal weapons. Sure, we've been watching the imitators. Some leak in hot weather, or freeze up when the thermometer dips, or they spray a mist, while still others contaminate and stain everything they touch. Oh, would you send out Mrs. Cohn, please? Oh. How are you, Mrs. Cohn? Oh, they've been treating you well. Oh, this won't take long, Mrs. Cohn. Would you just stand right here in front of the camera, please? Now, here's your ordinary garden variety, run-of-the-mill agitator. Now, let's try some of your ordinary run-of-the-mill garden variety, non-toxic weapon. Oh, yes, well, it, well, it, it, uh, it will work on, on your ordinary uh, uh, garden variety uh, demonstrator. Let's see, if, let's see how it'll do on, on, on the outside agitator type. Would you send him in, please? Yeah, isn't he a pretty... All right. You see? I told you it wouldn't work. Now we'll try a mace. Hey. Hey. Well, you can't do that. We're on we're on TV. Hey. Hey. What? Oh. Oh, what the fuck? What kind of jobs did you do as a as a boy? Uh, my first, I had a terrible experiences, uh, I might say. My first job was at the hand of a relative. They had moved into a store, a, a hardware store close to, right a block away from my high school, and I was invited to clean out their cellar. Their cellar had dirt an inch thick, and I don't know why this uh, old man, this man in his thirties couldn't do it, but he thought it would be nice to give me a job and to have my nose and throat filled for weeks with uh, detrita and coffee and so on. But I was very pleased to get my first job. That was my first job. Then in high school I also had other jobs. I would work summertime. I had to work, you know, family was close to, uh, didn't have much uh, backup for the income. Uh, there was this, I guess he was a, a Jewish refugee who, who made um, toys, stuffed toys out of rabbit skins. And the skins would come in and my job was to stretch the skin so that um, he could get a larger toy out of it, I guess. And I was very anxious to succeed, and after a week I had to quit because my wrists were paralyzed. So that's what, those were my first two wonderful job experiences, and I really learned what it is. I mean, I didn't think about it that way at the time, what it meant to be a poor bastard working for a boss. And I have had many other, I've had factory jobs and uh, I worked in a ribbon factory once where uh, you had the pleasure of running the ribbon and having it cut you. And you'd work with presses where if you put your hand there, you'd lose your hand. And um, 
other jobs. A few times I was turned down when I told them I was a college student because uh, they thought I wouldn't be, it would be too, uh, I wouldn't stay there very long, and of course they were right. And I can go on and on about the jobs, but uh, each one better than the next. During this time up until college, what were you listening to? What kind of music were you listening to? Um, I would, uh, my, we had a Victrola, one like that right behind there, big one. And uh, my, um, my uncle worked in a, one of my uncles worked in a music, in a um, electrical supplies music store. And we, we had a lot of records and I would, um, my mother would sing a lot, uh, a lot of Yiddish songs, and she would sing the popular music of the day. You know, we would go to movies, and that's about what it was. Um, then in high school, I guess, I, um, we were, we were uh, educated, and even in grade school, we had music classes, and they played classical music for us, and maybe twice a week. They don't do that anymore, I, I don't think. And so I, uh, I got a feeling for that. Let's see. And we learned them. We had to learn the melody <clears throat> like this. Barcarolle from tales of Hoffman written by Uffen Bach, Bach, Bach. Stuff like that. It's really great. And I remember I, I when one of the teachers asked me uh, who wrote something, I said, Beethoven, Beethoven, you know, that's how you pronounce it. And she said, no, it's pronounced Beethoven. So I, re I remember that to this day, that I was uh, following a rule, but the rule was wrong. You recognize the tune. East side, west side, all around the town. People are sleeping in buildings, Brooklyn bridges falling down. Meanwhile, business is booming in Soho and on Brooklyn Heights. Landlords are making a killing. Somehow, our world seems just right. Another day, another day, what's the big surprise? Developers pop quite a lot, a lot, a lot. Flowers are free at the price. People with you sky for shelter. People with no place to piss. One stand down Trump on his hat. Yeah, hey, hey. Oh, Cal Cotto was better than this. So he side, west side, all around the town. People freezing in suburbs. Cheap housing just ain't around. Meanwhile, stock exchange is zooming. Chocolate.